to call in. Um, having some technical difficulties with that, but uh, welcome to the 2017 meeting of the uh, Interagency <coughs> Committee on Sustainability and Green Procurement. Uh, <coughs> OGS Commissioner Destito, who has chaired this meeting uh, in person several times, uh, unfortunately can't make it today, and she sends her regrets and her uh, warm congratulations to all the uh, designees and sustainability coordinators who have worked uh, so hard on Hello? the report and the specifications Hi, is this, Darren? this year. Uh, this is Bill. Uh, uh, turns out the meeting is, just is called now. in, so. Okay, great. great. Thank you so much. Sure. Can you hear everything okay? And now we're going to get started. Uh, yeah. Beth? So, um, <clears throat> It's great to see everybody here. I think we should do a little round of introductions just because we have some new people that aren't used to everybody. Um, but why don't we do that first and then I'll say a couple of remarks. So I'm Beth Muir. I work for the executive um, <coughs> at the Department of Environmental Conservation. I'm my commissioner's designee to co-chair this interagency committee and he also sends his regrets. He's a big fan. He was very impressed with the report. Very exciting. Um, uh, my name is Darren DeRosha. I'm Commissioner DeStito's uh, OGS designee uh, for this committee. Uh, we co-chair with DEC. Beth and I also co-chair the uh, Green Procurement Subcommittee. And uh, Heather? Great. Uh, my name is Heather Saunders. I'm with NYSERDA, and I am our designee uh, for our president and CEO, John Rhodes. I also serve as our sustainability coordinator and the chair of the subcommittee for training on EO4. Hello everyone, I'm Diana Salahab from Green Department of Health. I'm Sandra Perrigine, Division of Budget. Hi, I'm Jody Smith Anderson, Director of Sustainability from DASNY and the designee from DASNY. I'm also the co-chair for the Operations and Engagement Subcommittee. Hi, I'm Kathy Kelly, I'm the designee for San uh, Sabrina T, the President and CEO of Environmental Facilities Corporation, and I'm also our Sustainability Coordinator and a member of the EO4 Training Subcommittee. Uh, I was going to say Brandon's on the phone, if you want to ask Brandon to introduce himself. Brandon, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, great. Brandon, can you introduce yourself? Yeah, Brandon Hardman, a sustainability analyst at the New York Power Authority. All right, thank you. you want to, oh, we can do that. We can, we can introduce yourself. Yeah. Okay. So I was just going to say a couple things, because um, we've done so many exciting things. This year I just wanted to... <coughs> some kudos all around, but uh, first I want to thank Governor Andrew Cuomo because under his leadership we have continued to build a very strong agency sustainability and green procurement program and I'm really proud of the things we've done this year. Just to tick off a few and we're going to go into more details in a moment, but first we revamped the sustainability coordination subcommittee um, into the operations and engagement subcommittee under Jody's leadership and our new co-chair from DEC, Brendan Woodruff, who's sitting over here. Brendan Wave for the wave for the people on on national television, um, <laughs> and we held the first Green New York Forum right here in one of these meeting rooms in December, w inviting all the sustainability coordinators to come, and it was a big success. And, and Brendan's going to talk about that a little bit. The other huge thing I think is this new Green Procurement Team of dedicated staff at OGS, and that is congratulations due to Todd Gardner, who's going to introduce himself and we'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, and then another one is this new Green New York website that we're also going to talk about, but so grateful to the digital team at OGS for working with us and putting that together, Jennifer Warner and Jeffrey Knack, and just a terrific job that they did, and I think it brings us into a whole new era. Um, also, I wanted to give a shout out to Shereen Brock, because this year we've had more reporting agencies than ever before. 90% of all covered agencies reported this year. And it was due to the hard work of really everyone around this table, because we all divvied up the list and called people and out, you know did outreach. But I'm really proud of the work the reporting subcommittee did on that. And then just finally, because I'm from DEC, I, I want to do a little shout out to our new sustainability structure that was launched this past year, and I'm very excited about that. So I think we've done a lot of great things, and I'm excited to hear more about them today. All right, great. So uh, we have a pretty packed agenda, so we'll try to Get it going here, the subcommittee reports. The first subcommittee um, is the new operations and engagement subcommittee and uh, error in the um, uh, agenda. Uh, 
I put down Brendan Woodruff, but it's co-chaired with Brendan and Jody Smith Anderson. So if either one of you guys, Brendan, um, you can hop right up there if you want to say a few words with Jody about. I'll just start. Uh, this is Jody, and we're really glad to have the Operations and Engagement Subcommittee because uh, the name reflects the two goals, which is to engage with all the sustainability coordinators in the process of greening New York State, which has always been the intent of the subcommittee, but has not been uh, as clear as it is now. So there are a couple of pieces to that um, that Brendan can uh, fill in a little more about, mostly the forum that happened at the end of last year, which I believe is already on the agenda. And then Green Your Commute Day, there's been a lot more activity and integration between the agencies in creating events throughout the state, and he could talk a little bit about that. The other half of it is the operations side, and in order to create the engagement, the structure will include um, defining issues that have been brought up in reporting of past and defining working groups to focus on those issues to improve the operational capabilities of all of the agencies. So the, the two parts really work very well together. We've only had a few uh, regular monthly meetings. The goal is to uh, solidify those and make those predictable, create those working groups with a feedback mechanism to pull in people of expertise in each of the subjects that are tackled and then to communicate that information out uh, broadly to all the sustainability coordinators. We don't want to just send out meeting minutes. We want to send out, here are the three things that we found most important in this meeting that you can help us define, and we're trying to maintain that tone through all of our work. So thank you very much for that restructuring, and I think Brenda and I are really glad to do the work. You want to add some parts and pieces there? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, so thanks, Jody. Um, I think we've got a really good partnership going here. Uh, I've got a great co-chair, and we've been doing some great work so far. Um, so as Jody mentioned, there are a couple things that we have done over the past year that we'd like to just touch on really quickly. Uh, the first one is the Green New York Forum that she mentioned. Uh, we had sustainability coordinators from over 34 agencies here in one of these rooms. It was an all-day event. Uh, we had Commissioner Sagos there. He gave some really good remarks, really set a good tempo for the day. It was a very productive meeting. We talked with the coordinators about how we can help them, how we can assist them, what obstacles there might be, and how we can help them overcome any barriers they have to operating more sustainably. I think there were a lot of good relationships that were created that day. Um, and there was a lot of good engagement. So we got a lot of information from them. They got a lot of information from us. And I think one of the most important things that our subcommittee has done so far is it's really giving the sustainability coordinators a place to go with their operational questions. So if they have a question about, you know, here's something that we're working on, you know, now they have a place to go where they know that they can get an answer or we can at least look into it and see what we can do to assist them. Uh, Green Your Commute Day is also coming up. It's the other big event that we're putting on in our first year here. It's going to be bigger and better than ever this year. We're really looking forward to it. It's on Friday, May 19th. Everybody should participate. Um, and it's a day where we really celebrate um, finding a greener alternative to getting to work. So whether it's walking, biking, taking public transit, carpooling, driving an electric vehicle. Uh, we've had some people kayak, unicycle. Haven't had anybody hoverboard yet, but you never know. This could be the first year. Um, and we do have a segue, yep. Um, so it's a really great day. Last year we had over 800 state employees participate. We offset 8.5 tons of carbon dioxide emissions in just that one day. This year is going to be much larger. And having the subcommittee here has allowed Jody and I to really go the extra mile. We put together a toolkit for all of the coordinators uh, that they can use to promote the event at their agencies. So we put together this one-stop shop. They've got everything they need, and I think we're going to get a lot more engagement with it this year. So I think the creation of this subcommittee has been a really positive force, um, and it's really doing a lot of good, and I'm really excited to see what we'll do over the next year. All right, thanks a lot, Jody and Brendan. Uh, Heather, for the training subcommittee. Okay, great, thank you. So the training subcommittee has been very busy uh, tackling a variety of guidance documents um, and other forms of training. Um, which have either been posted on the website, uh, the new Green New York website, or will be posted. Um, the first is a fuel efficient vehicle tip sheet, talks about the benefits, how to purchase them, et cetera. We worked with DASNY on showcasing their green building um, initiative, when, uh, when to implement energy efficiency, how to do it. 
Daz needs specific results, key tips for saving energy, such as dressing in layers and learning to control our own comfort rather than adjusting the thermostat and wasting energy. So I want to thank Jody. She did a great job with um, laying that all out, and I think it will be really helpful for coordinators and agency staff. Uh, coming soon, to complement one of the specifications we'll be talking about today, which is a battery specification, we'll have a tip sheet which talks about how to reduce single-use batteries and purchase quality rechargeable batteries, end-of-life disposal, and other important information. We also have been working with OGS's procurement services group on an EPK study about OGS's computer aggregate buy. And that will talk about environmental and cost savings. We have a greener meetings document in progress, as well as a document highlighting DASNY's copier fleet upgrade successes. Um, that was a really amazing pro project where uh, DASNY, over a long period of time, looked at their uh, copier fleet and, and tried to figure out how best to tackle um, making sure that they're purchasing consumables at the same time and just getting every possible efficiency gain possible um, as well as cost savings. So this will be something exciting we have coming down the pike as long as, uh, as well as, excuse me, a list of restaurants around the state that meet our state funded food spec um, and a greenwashing document. So we'll also have a booth at GovBuy this year which is OGS's vendor expo and uh, lots of vendors will be there and specifically ones that talk about um, environmentally preferable products. So we really want to make sure that coordinators get out, attend the workshops, meet the potential vendors, and stop by our Green New York booth next to OGS. We'll be there to answer questions for sustainability coordinators and agency staff, have displays about some really great success stories, and have our fact sheets and case studies, as well as the new website up. As the chair of the training subcommittee, I want to thank all of our subcommittee members who've contributed to the efforts, our interagency partners, and the sustainability coordinators and agency staff who have really helped to drive our focus. So thank you. Thanks a lot, Heather. I'm not sure. All right. Uh, the reporting subcommittee uh, is chaired by Shireen Brock, but uh, <coughs> that's going to say a few words. Yeah, Shireen sends her regrets. They had scheduled a few. Um, months ago, actually, a meeting on the Environmental Excellence Awards for this afternoon that Shireen could not get out of. In fact, Marta Pazlusny, who's one of our authors, also runs that program, and they both, I think, would have attended, and they send their regrets. But I really want to just talk briefly about some of the things that Shireen was able to accomplish with all of us, working with her. Um, I've already mentioned it, but we did increase the number of reporters. So we had 66 reporters this year, 90% out of uh, approximately 73 affected entities that are covered by the order. And it all comes after a major effort um, to make the reporting form less onerous for smaller agencies. And last year we did a huge effort to streamline that, to block questions. Christina DeNovo, who is here um, to support some of the specs that we've been working on, um, helped a lot with doing that and blocking the, um, the questions. And just wordsmithing the questions. I mean, having a good survey monkey question is really hard to, to do. And every year, I think it's going to get easier and easier and clearer and clearer, but it, every year you have to tweak it a little bit just to make sure. So I'm really proud of the work that um, we've been doing under Shireen's leadership. We did a little more of that, smoothing out the kinks in the Survey Monkey this year. We're almost done with that. And uh, I think this year's product, the survey, will be even better than last year's. And it'll, I think, encourage even more people to participate. So we're shooting for 100%. <coughs> participation. We only have um, seven agencies to go, or actually six. Well, no, seven, seven. I can't do math in my head. Seven agencies to go. <laughs> and uh, also, as I mentioned <coughs> before, there was a real effort in the last few years to reach out to the agencies we hadn't heard from. So when it gets around to be the beginning of October, and we haven't heard from f uh, someone, we start calling them, we, we contact them, we ask for extra names in the form this year for who else at your agency works on this issue. So if someone's left their position, we can find them. I think that's going to really help. Um, and I think it's one of the reasons why we've had an increase in reporters. And I just want to do a shout out to uh, two staff, one at OGS and one at DEC, who have done a terrific job year to year on this data quality control and data cleansing. It's it really one of the biggest jobs of the report is to look at the waste data, the quantitative data that comes in, make sure that the information coming from the agencies doesn't have something 
wrong with it? Like, is it really different from last year? Did they leave something blank? Did they fill in the same number in, in two columns? I mean, it's amazing how many of those mistakes. Usually, I think Gary was reaching out to almost 20 agencies this year just to make sure that the information they sent was accurate. And the person who did that for us this year at OGS for paper was Jessica Paul. And I just want to thank her for the efforts that she made. So I'm very excited about what we've been doing with reporting. I think it's getting better every year, and it will be even even better next year. Beth, can I just jump in for a yes. second? So the training subcommittee is also working with the reporting subcommittee to provide some kind of webinar training, and we're looking um, to probably do that just before the report is released, and so we think it will be really helpful for the folks reporting. Thanks very much. Uh, another exciting development is the creation of at OGS and procurement services of a green procurement team headed by Todd Gardner. So Todd's going to tell us a little bit about that. Thanks. Yeah, uh, thank you. I'm, I'm very happy to have been given the opportunity to lead the new green procurement team at OGS. And I'd also like to thank the committee for all of its hard work in developing specs and promoting green purchasing over the years. Uh, this committee has a long history of accomplishments that are well documented in the annual reports, and I think the new team builds on those. Um, and some of those accomplishments are being recognized with awards. For example, we recently received the 2017 EPEAT Purchasers Award for the use of EPEAT specifications in our computer aggregate buy program. And so the goals of the new team will be to develop green contracts, help purchasers find green products, and also to help users identify savings and benefits of purchasing green. So we have several projects planned for the next year to further those goals, and that includes procurements for environmentally friendly lighting and photovoltaic systems. And we all, we're also working on a project to study green labeling practices in order to identify green labeling needs. So uh, just to conclude, I look forward to leading the new team, and I'm going to do everything I can to make sure it's a success. Thanks, Todd. Yep. All right. So now we just want to just quickly highlight the creation of the new uh, Green New York or Green NY website uh, hosted on the OGS uh, public website. Unfortunately, we're doing this with an old school laptop, so it doesn't look <laughs> exactly as it would on your monitor at your desktop um, at your workstation or your desk, which is probably a little wider. And these, these cards should be three in a row. And I guess uh, they have to be three in a row, technically speaking, for some reason. And so you see you have your buy green card, um, your energy card, and your toxics and waste card. Still in development are the education and engagement is going to become the fourth card. And then there will be a uh, conservation, uh, conserving natural resources and water quality card, and a three R's, uh, reuse, recycling, and composting programs card. So um, you can see that there's, you know, it's kind of the idea was to be a one stop shop for information for. Uh, people at agencies who might be purchasers or in building operations. Um, if you uh, click on, as Bill just did, uh, one of the uh, specification links, um, you get to this green purchasing requirements page and you can see the, then if you clicked on the approved uh, specs, you'd see them all set forth there and you, you know, up or I'm whatever. Pulling up a spec because they look a lot better. Yeah. They, they were reformatted. So just choose any one of those, Bill, and just open one. Isn't that amazing? Right. So <laughs> they look so much better. Yeah. So it's like a web page instead of uh, a PDF. And similarly, uh, on that page will be the tentatively approved specification. So today. If uh, we have two new specifications on the agenda, if those are tentatively approved by the, uh, this interagency committee, they'll be posted there um, for public comment. And uh, 
we'll actually have a discussion about that procedure um, when we get to those. But just to kind of familiarize everybody with this, and oh, I did want to, uh, Jennifer Warner, who led the team to develop this, and we owe her a great, great you know, debt of gratitude. Uh, she did mention that this morning she put on the OGS uh, public website um, a couple of links, one under um, what's happening, a link to this meeting, and one under just uh, operations and administration on the OGS homepage is a link to right to this Green NY uh, webpage. So oh, here's where cool. we'll have all of our information from building operations to procurement yeah, I'm not, I'm not an IT person, but I'm thinking <coughs> that this new formatting, especially with the specs, will help people search for stuff. I think it's going to come up in search engines more easily. Right. I see Brent, Brendan's nodding his head. He knows a lot more about this than I do, but um, I'm, I can't tell you how exciting this is to me. The first meeting, and um, most of us in this room have been engaged with this project, and everyone has put a lot of time into it, but Jennifer has been such a pleasure as our host for the whole conversation. And Jeff uh, and Jeff Na and Jeffrey Knack, who we've all also mentioned. But um, you know, the first time that Heather and I saw this, we walked out and said, "My gosh, what we work on is really cool and exciting. <laughs> it's amazing how when you see it in that kind of format, it just really makes it pop. It's great. And when you see it on, you know, a um, non-dinosaur laptop, it really <laughs> is visually awesome. Um, there's tons of information. The look, the feel, everything is really good so again just hats off to, to Jennifer and Jeffrey um, and thanks to OGS for having um, giving us the opportunity to put this in one spot this is really awesome Thank you. even more opportunity for engagement <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> That's what we're for. Yeah. All right. fantastic so uh, great good we're good doing well on time we're gonna uh, start our review of the fifth progress report so while uh, Bill is bringing that up, I'm just gonna. I have a list of people to thank, and it's you know it's a little it's a little lengthy, but we are ahead <laughs> of time. So I'm gonna be like the Oscars, although I haven't won anything. Um, you guys are the winners here, and then the state of New York, the people of the state of New York. So um, many thanks first to all the sustainability coordinators from all over the state, from 73 you know different agencies covered by this order, who fill out the report at their agency. A lot of the agencies like ours have regional offices and regional facilities. We have um, a lot of employees and a lot of buildings, and it goes out to those regions. This happens with DOT. I know it happens with health. You know, Diana has done a great job, too. And then it comes back to them from all these regional facilities, and they have to compile their report. In, in some ways, it's almost as complicated as what we do to compile the whole thing. So I really want to thank all the sustainability coordinators who do that work every year. And you continue to impress and energize us with your efforts. When I read through the open-ended questions and people are just talking about what they're doing, I get jazzed every time. Um, it's great. So I also want to thank the team of authors who took on sections of the report, and many of you are here. So Darren writes the letter from the commissioner. He's also the last editor of record, so he makes sure that anything really wrong is not wrong. Um, and he, he writes the paper purchasing section, which is no easy task because it has to do with that whole like data cleansing thing. And he worked really closely with Jessica. I'll get to her in a second. Christina DeNovo, who's in our audience, she works for the Pollution Prevention Unit at DEC. She wrote the Promise of Sustainability section this year, and she worked really closely with Connor Shea, who also is in the Pollution Prevention Unit, on the Toxic Use Reduction section. And she helped edit, after I really needed some extra help, um, the water and natural resource conservation section and the training section. Thank you, Christina. Uh, Jody and Marna, most puzzlers and you couldn't be here, but Jody's here, wrote the people planning and money section. Usually the most dynamic writing in the report is Jody's. <laughs> um, I, I always have to wonk it down, you know, a little bit, but it's great. Um, and Jody and Brendan, I'll get to Brendan's contribution in a second, also helped review all the challenges sections because as chair and co-chair of uh, the Operations and Engagement Subcommittee, we really needed their eyes on what people were having trouble with. And I think that having us closely read where people are going, that's why we knew that we needed panels, for example, on lease spaces and surplus value at the Green New York Forum last year. 
Gary Feinland, who I've already mentioned, but he runs the numbers on waste reduction, reuse and recycling. Uh, Terry Layback, Carrie Jane King, Brandon Hardman from NIPO, who's on the phone. Thank you, Brandon. Did a lot of work writing the waste reduction section. Amy Bloomfield and Terry wrote the recycling section. These are always complicated. There's a lot of data there. Um, they were great. Heather Saunders takes on a big lift every year in energy efficiency and renewable energy and training. Um, Brendan does the transportation section in addition to the challenges. Um, and then a fairly large team, because it's getting bigger every year, the conservation of water and natural resources. We focus on water conservation itself. Then we focus on green infrastructure and stormwater uh, management, like in ways that and Kathy Kelly from EFC is very familiar with, ways to keep stormwater from running right into our surface water and polluting that, and sustainable landscaping. And each of those sections is expanding every year. And Nancy Goody from the Attorney General's Office, Amy Bloomfield from DC Region 3, and Terry Leback from Region 3, and Marta Posluzny again from the Pollution Prevention Unit at DC all helped draft that this year. Jessica Paul did this great job with the paper with Darren. And then Todd writes most of the green purchasing chapter. I help him with the introduction and I look at the challenges, but he writes all the pieces about the specs and the contracts and the spending and all of that. It's always a really great section. And last but not least, Evan Barr. Evan, wave your hand. My intern from uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute who wrote the EO18 section this year and had to slog through all the folks that are covered or not covered by the EO18 order, which is slightly different than EO4. Um, and he also helped me compile and edit the whole rest of the report. And it was the first time I had an intern, and I don't think I'm ever going back if I could possibly <laughs> get one as good as Evan, although I won't have Evan every year, unfortunately. Um, because he's a really good writer and a scientist at the same time, and that is a rarity and a wonderful thing. So thank you, Evan. So those are all my thank yous. And to go through some highlights, um, really exciting stuff as always this year. The paper use continues to decrease, and we always lead with that, and I'm hoping that um, Sandra will be impressed with us, because you know it's the division budget. But uh, we still had in decreases in paper use, and since 11-12, we've saved $19.6 million in spending. We know that because we track how much they buy, and so we know that every year that, that purchase has gone down. And we're saving um, roughly about $7 million a year <coughs> going forward. And from 2008, the savings are $40.9 million. So we've really saved a significant amount of money, and paper use um, reduction is a great thing. And we see a little bit of a bump up there from the 12, 13, 13, 14, and it's because we had more reporters. We increased the number of reporters. And this year, we increased the number of reporters over last year, and the number went down from last year. So we're still seeing some decrease there in paper use. Um, recycling rates. The recycling story is really interesting this year. And if you could bring up that table, Bill. Um, the recycling rate has been over 70%. That's the bottom line there in the orange. And this year, when Gary first brought me the data for waste, it, I was a little bit uh, taken aback because we had a bump up this year. We've seen two of these. One was in 10-11, and another was this year in 15-16. And they're both due to an increase in the amount of construction and demolition debris generated by um, DOT and MTA. In 2010-11, in it was all MTA. It was about 200,000 tons of construction and demolition debris. And it's one of the reasons that we, we track all these trends, but we can't say for sure exactly how we're doing because some of these things go up and down. But generally speaking, the trend is down on waste generation but the really exciting story here is that in 2011, 10-11, when we had the bump from MTA, that amount of waste was not recycled. And that's why you see the, the slight dip in recycling rate for that year, it was 45%. This year, the bump is from an increase in uh, cold in place recycling of asphalt by DOT, about 130 or so thousand tons, and then about 70,000 extra tons of recycling of um, construction and demolition debris generated by MTA, but this time, all of that increase was recycled. And so that's why you see this incredible bump this year in the recycling rate. That's why it's a 78% recycling rate. So in the end, this story tells a really exciting um, story and trend, and MTA also gave us detailed information about the program they're implementing in 
2014, they adopted a very ambitious goal of recycling construction and demolition debris, a goal of 100%. And in 1516, only um, two years or a year and a half out, out of the 105 projects they did this year for construction, 32 achieved a 100% recycling rate and 48 achieved a rate over 90%. And that's why you see this incredible jump in recycling of construction and demolition debris. So I'm very excited about that and happy to report about what our brethren at MTA and DOT have been doing. Um, recycled paper purchasing has stayed, st stayed strong. So every year it's increased a little bit. And that paper, the paper is also on that, that first chart, Bill, the paper, and it shows on here. There you go. So you can see the percentage of copy paper that is 100% um, post-consumer content recycled. And we have the highest rate ever this year at 57%. And it's steadily increased from 22% in the first year of reporting in 0809. And I think in part that is due to a very strong contracting model by OGS. We have great uh, truckload and non-truckload lot contracts that offer 100% um, recycled content paper at very competitive pricing. In fact, our research shows that the cost of recycled content, 100% recycled content paper, is really now exactly the same. Last year it was slightly less, when we do the calculations right now, it's almost exactly the same. It's like 25 cents per box more right now than the 30%. And it's well over, well cheaper than the virgin paper. Um, bottled water remains one of our biggest successes. All covered agencies under EO18, and those are the executive agencies, have virtually eliminated the use of water. There's a number that still have exemptions, about eight, but they're very restrictive. Like, so they use bottled water on buses for prisoners or in remote locations where the water is not potable. And 88% of authorities and public benefit corporations that are not covered by the executive order are eliminating the purchase of bottled water anyway. And this is an incredible cultural change, and you can see it with our water on the table today. Um, in the past, we had stopped building new buildings with drinking fountains in them, because people were so used to having people purchase water. And it's extremely expensive. So this is one of the places where we've really saved money. We've never asked them for exactly how much money they were spending before, so we don't know the total amount of savings. But when people tell us, like the Sunnis or some of the uncovered, the agencies that don't have to comply, tell us, oh yeah, we spent like $35,000 on, on water, we're gonna stop that. You know, They look at it, and we make them look at how much they're spending when they report, so that's really exciting. Um, composting of organics, the recycling of organic material has risen 34% this year from over last year, and so this is another huge trend. We're really looking at this in New York State DEC is very interested in getting organic material out of landfills where they are a greenhouse gas um, source. And that increased 34% led by SUNY, the State University of New York, the campus is there. Uh, CUNY also, and I do a shout out for DEC, our re uh, central office started composting this year with an actual um, professional service and I don't have the stats of the tons, I should have brought it, but anyway, and six of our regional, or our nine regional offices are composting. So it's a very, very big success. And finally, um, one shout out for parks. <coughs> the Robert Moses uh, State Park is a 693 kilowatt solar array, and it's just coming online, and it will make them the first energy neutral park in the nation. And inside, that's on our cover this year, very exciting. And um, Inside the report are a lot more exciting projects being done by agencies, and it's a great read, worth reading, and that's the, that's the highlights. All right. Uh, thanks a lot, Beth. Uh, so we have time for some discussion, and if there are any questions or discussion, and then we're going to, um, I'm just going to ask for a vote, uh, and we'll formally accept the, hopefully, accept the report and it can be issued today and, and be publicly available. Jody? Yeah, Beth, I just wanted to follow up on the statement about construction waste management, and this is more of a looking forward statement, but I think our report has had a lot to do with this. Uh, DASNY and the construction fund each received a letter from the uh, SUNY Sustainability uh, Coalition 
stating that the SUNY system has a goal for zero net waste, and because of that, they want to work with DASNY and the construction fund to define the specifications and the goals for all the construction projects, including tracking so that they are able to start to prove what has been diverted from landfill. Um, what's really powerful about that is true construction waste management to aim to zero net waste means not just diverting from landfill, but it means initially designing to avoid waste creation, which I think is key in materials management mentality. So SUNY has made that statement as an institution. I think that EO4 and what we've already accomplished help them to be able to do that, and hopefully DASNY and the Construction Fund and other agencies that build will be able to pony up and do the right work for that. That's true. Okay. So uh, all in favor of uh, accepting the FIT progress report on state green procurement and agency sustainability for fiscal year 2015-16, please say aye. 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 All, any opposed? No? Okay, great. So it's accepted and will be made publicly available. Thanks, everybody. So now we'll move into doing uh, the specifications. <coughs> we'll start with the uh, specifications that last year were tentatively approved, posted for public comment, and so this year uh, we will be uh, voting on those specifications for final approval. Uh, some public comment or agency comment was received on several of these, so some of them you'll see in <coughs> red, uh, some red line fashion. Um, we'll get rid of that once have talked about it, but just to make it clear what changes were made from last year's version. Uh, we left we left those strikeouts and underlines in. Um, the first one we're going to talk about uh, that we did receive some comments on and that um, made a few alterations pursuant to those comments was the furniture specification. And John Vanna from DEC has worked really hard on this for over a year. So John. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks, Darren. Um, John Van Am, the chief of DEC's Pollution Prevention Unit. Um, as some of you may, may recall that we were here last year, um, when, we, when we issued this spec tentatively, I committed to going out and really actively kind of seeking feedback from furniture vendors on the spec. Um, so I think we accomplished that. Christina DeNovo, who works on our pollution prevention team at DEC, really did a great job reaching out to vendors on the contract and Corecraft. Um, so basically, we shared the spec with everybody on the current furniture contract uh, and requested any feedback that they had on it. Um, and we also shared the spec specifically with Corecraft and held a, a focused conference call with them in June 2016 to explain the spec and to take their feedback. Um, so that resulted in comments from 34 entities. Um, I will say many of the manufacturers that commented simply said that they were um, supporting comments that were received from the Industry Association, which is the Business and Institutional Furniture Manufacturers Association. Um, so there, as Darren mentioned, you have a red line edited version of the spec that reflects the comments that were received. Um, just what I wanna do is just quickly kind of run you through the kind of the, the thinking behind the edits, why we made them. Um, they, again, they were all reflective of the comments that were received. Um, two new definitions were added to the spec, as you can see. Um, one is total recycled content. Um, we did reference total recycled content in the spec initially, and we got feedback that we should further define that. So this definition is more of an industry standard that's used um, in the furniture industry um, through BIFMA standards and also through LEED. Um, so we adopted that definition. Um, and the perfluorinated chemical definition is also added to be consistent with some other specs that we're gonna be reviewing today as well, the, the single use food container spec. Um, moving on to the, the specification section, um, in, in this area, you know, this is an area where folks can, don't have to completely comply with every performance category we have, um, but we did change it slightly to um, at least make it a, um, um, folks aware that they can comply with more than one performance category. Um, 
and we also provided an encouragement to seek um, folks compliance with the low emitting standard. Um, we think that's a pretty important standard and it seems to be pretty widely accepted within the industry for furniture products that are applicable to, to indoor air emissions. Um, in, a, in, a, in that section as well, um, the total recycled content was changed slightly. Um, we reduced that to 30% from 40%, and that's reflective of trying to be more consistent with other certification standards that's out there, and also reflective of the definition change. The definition change for total recycled content is a bit more ag aggressive in how you measure total recycled content in that it, it diminishes the value of uh, pre-consumer content or doesn't value that quite as much. Um, the next section where you'll, where you'll see a, a really a fair amount of um, red lines, or in this case blue lines, um, chemical content is where most of the substantive changes that, to the spec took place. And what I'll offer here initially, when this spec went out um, in a tentative approved fashion, the chemical um, um, content that we had here, we basically said all furniture shall not contain. So they were pretty restrictive in, in what we asked for initially. And we got a fair amount of pushback from both the business side and our environmental NGO side that we needed to be a little bit more specific and add thresholds to those things. Um, folks basically told us that it would be really difficult to meet these shall not contain um, requirements. So what you see here is, is really reflective of that. Um, it's an effort to place more realistic thresholds for each of the chemical substances. And in all instances that we have up here, I think the, the more specificity we added makes the restriction easier for manufacturers to achieve. I don't think in any, in any case did we become more restrictive than what we had initially because initially we said it shall not contain any of this. And in this case, we kind of added more specific kind of threshold requirements. Um, that's a lot, there's a lot of changes in there. Um, so I, what I wanted to do was just kind of pause right there and see if anybody has any questions. I wasn't gonna tick through each of the changes but if anybody has any concerns or questions on those, I'd be happy to um, address them. Okay, hearing nothing, I will move on to the next section, which is, um, next section we have changes is the flame retardant section. Um, and again, there's, there's a fair amount of red line in, in this. Um, I will say there's not, as, there's not as much change here. A lot of this was really restructuring um, to make it, a, you know, some feedback we got was that it would be better to restructure it and make it focused on the purchasing categories that people would be kind of looking for. And those are upholstered furniture that has to comply with technical bulletin 117, upholstered furniture that has to comply with technical bulletin 133, and then non-upholstered furniture that doesn't need to comply with either of those um, flame retardancy standards. So what you see here is three kind of distinct kind of paragraphs that each focus on compliance with those three areas because each kind of um, mechanism that a manufacturer have to take to comply is, is slightly different for each of those. Um, within that, there are, there are a couple, um, you know, what I would call more substantive changes that I'll, I'll mention that we did um, integrate into this more revised version. Um, the first item for, for furniture that needs to comply with technical bulletin 117 furniture, and again, just for your kind of little refresher, Technical Bulletin 117 is a California standard that was revised several years ago. Um, and in the revisions, um, California revised the standard, which is basically applied across the nation, um, to allow flame retardancy to be met without added chemicals. So there's other means that manufacturers can take to meet that Technical Bulletin 117 standard. So our specification um, requires um, furniture vendors to meet that TB117 standard without, without chemicals added to the, uh, chemical flame retardants added. So what we additionally added, we also adopted some more information from California. Um, and so basically we required that any technical bulletin 117 compliant upholstered furniture, um, we will also ask for labeling compliant with a California standard. That basically will tell us that this furniture is compliant with technical bulletin 117 and that it complies with that standard without any flame retardants. Um, we followed up with BIFMA, which again is the Business and Institutional Furniture Manufacturers Association to get their feedback on whether this would be problematic. Um, they were fine with us adopting you know, a labeling standard and, and concurred that if we were gonna adopt a labeling standard that they would definitely prefer that we kept it consistent with what California's adopted. Uh, many of these vendors are you know, doing business across the nation so it's not a, most of them are labeling their, their, 
products complying with the California labeling standard regardless of where the furniture is going. Um, so they didn't see any issues with, with adding the labeling standard. From our perspective as a government agency, it, it's, it's valuable as well because technical bulletin 117 compliant furniture cannot be used in certain, um, certain occupancies, certain um, buildings that don't have um, meet certain kind of um, um, sprinkler, don't have certain sprinkler systems cannot have technical bulletin 117 compliant furniture. So I think the labeling is valuable from a user perspective to know whether that furniture can be moved into a use that requires, uh, requires other flame retardancy standards such as technical bulletin 133. And the, the final change that I'll, I'll mention, which again is in the flame retardant section, um, the other area of um, kind of compliance and flame retardancy is technical bulletin 133. And again, this is for, this is, a, this is more aggressive kind of flame retardancy. This is for furniture and buildings that don't have sprinkler systems. Um, so to meet those flame retardancy standards, chemicals still need to be applied. Um, so our spec does not, does not fully restrict flame retardants. If somebody needs to purchase technical bulletin 133 um, compliant furniture, but what we did here, it, we made a slight change to restrict the use of halogenated flame retardants, which is a certain class of um, the more um, toxic and dangerous um, flame retardants. Um, the tentatively approved version included this as an encouragement. We were requested by environmental NGOs to look into the potential to um, um, restrict halogenated flame retardants. Um, so we considered that. We followed up with, with Biffman manufacturers and they indicated that they have sufficient products available that this shouldn't be an issue complying with. And you know, technical bulletin 133 compliant furniture is gonna be a very, very, very small subset of what the state purchases anyway. The vast majority of the of furniture that we, we purchase should only need to comply with technical bulletin 117. Um, so we think we're on good grounds with those changes. Um, and that, that's really a quick overview of the, um, the changes. Any questions? Uh, that's great, John. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so if there's no questions, uh, basically I will ask for a vote to accept the amended version uh, for final approval. So I move to accept the amended version for final approval. Okay. I'll second that. Very good. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. Any opposed? Nope. Fantastic. That's congratulations, John. Thank you. Congratulations, Christina. Uh, next, uh, Beth's going to walk us through the tentatively approved disinfectants and sanitizers. So this specification was tentatively approved last uh, spring, and we've only had comments from the health department. They, um, the specification tracks the specifications that are in the multi-state environmental acceptable purchasing contract that we entered into with Massachusetts um, back in 2015, and that process was also open to public comment, so I think that one of the reasons we didn't get a lot of comments is that that had already been open to comment. Um, and a lot of vendors were already complying with it. So there weren't a lot of issues from the industry side um, and from the, uh, the NGO community. But um, health was great and they came up with some um, concerns they had. And this is, this is a big culture change because we're, we're looking now at something that has been is very heavily regulated. It's really a pesticide. These are really um, pesticides. They kill things. Um, you're not allowed to say that they're truly green. You can't, they can't be green steel certified um, because of that. And so it, they, we do have um, the kinds of things that, that green steel looks at, but we can't, we can't have exactly them being called a green product. So it's, it's a complicated area. And the idea of how it fits in with regulations was also, I think, really of interest to DOH. So there's a number of regulations out there for uh, daycare settings, for MRSA control in healthcare settings that are very specific on what disinfection um, products can be used. And they recommend uh, usually two alternatives. One is an EPA-registered 
product, which means it's registered under the FIFRA, Federal Inf um, Insecticide and Fungicide Act, as a, as a insecticide, as a pesticide. Um, and when the registration occurs, it doesn't mean only that it's safe to be used, it means that it's effective in that setting. So it's a very specific registration. They allow that or some type of bleach, and they usually tell you exactly what the dilution should be for that bleach. And where we've tried to make strides and where the contract, the green contract made strides was to encourage agencies to seek out these EPA registered products that use active ingredients that have the potential for a less environmental and public health impact when used properly. And <coughs> we're seeking out these alternatives to things like bleach, which is an asthmogen, and quaternary ammonium chloride compounds that also have environmental uh, and health concerns. So the things that we did to change the specification from last year was to make it, um, to give a lot more background on the regulatory landscape, to make it clear that this is a very regula regulated area, and to explain a little bit more why we're interested in encouraging healthcare professionals to move in this direction. And we keep the language describing the folks that actually came up with this specification for the contract, which was the Massachusetts Tox Toxics Reduction Task Force that had members from the Massachusetts Health Department on it and experts from uh, the Responsible Purchasing Network in California also working with it. The other thing we did was we underscored that this entire specification is an encouragement and not a requirement. And I think that's a really important thing when you have a really big culture change here. People are very used to using bleach. We're trying to say that yes, the bleach is, is even the way these regulations are drafted, it's recommended as a solution um, by the health department in these certain situations along with these EPA registered alternatives. And we wanna make it clear that you are not required to use those alternatives. You're still allowed to use bleach, very important. And I think it's a great step forward because we don't, w we wouldn't want to come out, I don't think we would be successful anyway, and we don't want to change it up so dramatically that people stop using bleach. We want for them to start thinking about the benefits of using something, al an alternative to bleach, and there are al dozens of products on the contract that meet those, those regulatory requirements um, from DOH, which is terrific. A lot of them have pro um, hydrogen peroxide in them. Um, so we're trying to keep those regulations in place while we're encouraging them to work within those regulations to look for alternatives, which I think is a great way to go. And slow but steady, we change that, that culture. Um, we added something here too, that in addition to being EPA registered, any um, alternative disinfection, any disinfectant really, must also be registered by New York State DEC. Those are our New York State pesticide rules. Not every product registered by EPA is registered by DEC. Our program is a little more stringent in terms of the protection of safety. So we added that. And then the big change we would made, and it's at the end of the spec bill, you'll see a lot of red line here. And we had a really important discussion with our health department colleagues, and then I went back to the Massachusetts Task Force um, task force uh, members and the health department in Massachusetts and RPN to talk about this. And in the end, we decided to let go of the encouragement for alternatives to bleach in food contact sanitization. Food contact sanitizers are extremely difficult to, um, to wrestle with because when you're sanitizing something that food is gonna come into contact with, the pesticide itself has to be <coughs> very safe for people because you might eat it. I mean, you might, it might actually eat the, the, the um, piece of food that you have, have contact with this pesticide and it has to work very quickly. So what they call the kill rate has to be very quick, but the, but the product has to be very safe. And bleach is one of the few things that meets that requirement. And the only thing on contract, on the green cleaning contract that meets this is a product, I'm not gonna name it, um, but it's a product that uses hydrogen peroxide in a mix with something called peroxidic acid. 
And in the specification as drafted before, we noted, because it was noted in the contract, that when you add peroxidic acid to hydrogen peroxide, you create something that is also an asthmogen. And California had done some work on that to show that it's not as much of an as asthmogen, perhaps, as bleach, but it still had an issue. And in the end, after speaking with the health department and speaking with um, my colleagues in Massachusetts and California, we decided that this particular aspect of the specification was just not quite ready for prime time. I think we're still working on the idea of finding some food contact uh, sanitizers that will um, work, that are less problematic than bleach for asthma, for example. But um, we're still not quite there, and it wasn't going to affect greatly the, the use of alternative products since there's a very limited population out there. So we're putting that aside for now, and we're just noting that in the um, non-food contact sanitization arena, we actually don't want to encourage um, folks to use hydrogen peroxide mixed with peroxidic acid. We're not saying you can't. We're just not saying that that's the strongly encouraged. We have a list of uh, ingredients that are strongly encouraged. And I think if you go down a little further, Bill, you'll see that below the cross out, encouraged active ingredients. And we just made sure that the mixtures that might violate the criteria, because the criteria we have for this spec are that it doesn't cause asthma, it doesn't cause cancer, and those kinds of things would be done. And then the other thing that the health department asked us to do is just not call out the um, actual ingredients above their bill that we're trying to uh, move away from. They just felt like that was a little problematic. They didn't want people to be confused about whether or not they could still use bleach. And I think in the end, that f is fine. I think the message we're sending to consider alternatives will work just what fine, and I'm very grateful to the work that Diana did to pull her folks together at the health department. I can't see your face, Diana, there you go. <laughs> um, thank you very much, because it's not easy, and she had to pull together people from the Center for Environmental Health as well as the infectious disease folks, and it's a really big lift for these guys to think about moving toward things that um, could be less problematic for the initial contact with the folks using them, but you know the concern that they might not be as effective is really acute, and so I think it's a great movement forward, and I'm very excited about it. Right. Thanks, Beth. I know a lot of work went into that. Um, so uh, I'm not sure that Robert's rules apply to this board, this committee, but I will take a motion to... Should we ask for questions? Or oh, I'm sorry. sorry. Questions? questions? Yes. Comments? None. I will then uh, accept a motion to uh, accept the amended version of the disinfectants and sanitizer spec for final approval. Motion. Thanks, Heather. Uh, all in favor, please say aye or yes. Aye. aye. Any opposed? Great. That is for final approval. Thank you very much. Next, Beth will also walk us through a amended version of the tentatively approved hand cleaners and hand soaps specification. Okay, yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, I'll try not to be too uh, long-winded here. So um, here, we did do a lot of changes here, and it has to do with the fact that, who knew, um, hand antiseptics, which is actually the word for hand sanitizer, is a very complicated area. Um, there's a lot of different kinds. They're regulated by the um, Food and Drug Administration. And we have a clear delineation between consumer hand antiseptics, and there's two kinds of those, washes and rubs, and healthcare antiseptics. So the very first thing we did was um, we decided to have this specification only cover the consumer side. And again, I consulted with uh, the Massachusetts folks and the California folks. These are also a specification that's in our green cleaning contract. And the focus um, of their work, too, was on the consumer side, so that was fine. We updated the standards and certifications for hand soap because they had been a little bit outdated. That was the old specification requirements there, and they stay as requirements. The requirements for consumer hand antiseptics and hand rubs, hand washes and rubs, uh, are also required. We model the uh, restrictions now, 
put out this past year by the Food and Drug Administration that consumer antiseptic hand washes cannot contain antimicrobials. You guys might have been familiar with that in the press. Um, and for consumer antiseptic hand rubs, we note the CDC guidelines for <coughs> the percentage of alcohol that is the most effective. And that was something that the health department asked us to do as well. And for the shampoos and body washes, we made it clear that um, this is consumer product, so it does not cover, it's only things regulated by the Food and Drug Administration as cosmetics and not something regulated by the Food and Drug um, Administration as a drug. So medicated shampoos are regulated by FDA as a drug and they are not covered by this specification and we did not mean to say that you couldn't have a medicated shampoo, for example, something that kills lice. Um, and the body, uh, the body wash and shampoo section is an encouragement only because there's, there's, on, there's only two standards out there now. There's not a lot of products. There's not a huge number of products under those, but they are available on our contract, our new green cleaning contract, and these specifications bring us into harmony with that, and that's a very exciting thing. Faster. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, are there any questions or comments? Okay, then uh, I will take a motion to accept the amended version of the hand cleaners, hand soaps, consumer antiseptic hand washes and hand rubs and personal care cleaning products <laughs> specification for final approval. I move to do all that. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jody. Uh, okay, all in favor, uh, say aye or yes. Aye. Any opposed? Great. That is approved. Next, we will uh, go to the industrial and institutional cleaning products, uh, tentatively approved spec, which name is actually changed to general purpose cleaners in these amendments. And Beth will walk us through. And I really don't have any, I wasn't going to, I did not prepare myself to go through these in detail. These were not changed from last year. Oh, this was an update. So these are, yep, th this is an update. It's an old, it's an existing specification that we updated last year. Right. And so we do not need to discuss this. There were no comments and there were no amendments from last year. Great, great, great. Okay. So I probably should have put on the agenda general purpose. Sorry, Sorry about that. Um, are there any questions or comments from anyone? Okay. Uh, I'll take a motion to accept for final approval the tentatively approved specification on general purpose cleaners. I will so move. Thank you. <laughs> All in favor, uh, say aye or yes. Aye. aye. Any opposed? Great. That is approved. Thank you very much. Next, uh, Heather uh, will um, answer any questions or, uh, or take any comments on the tentatively approved lighting fixtures, ballast, and lamps specification. Okay, so um, on behalf of Peter Hoffman, who led the working group on the specification, uh, I want to share some um, comments. We did have one entity that was a lighting design <laughs> and manufacturing company that did submit a couple of comments. Um, as the working group, we chose not to incorporate those. Um, the reason was that after reviewing it, um, we felt that incorporating the recommendations would give that particular company an unfair advantage over others. Um, they also had one specific comment that um, we felt the science behind the recommendations had really not been studied enough. We did check with DO, um, DOT, excuse me, not DOT, DO, uh, DOH. Uh, we also checked with the lighting research center at RPI, our advisory council, and we really felt that the, again, the um, science behind the recommendations had not been studied enough, and consequently the impact of what they were saying was questionable. So again, for those reasons, we did not make any modifications to the specification. So it's the same uh, spec that was tentatively approved, and uh, are there any questions? Then I will take a motion to accept for final approval the lighting fixtures, ballast, and lamp specification. Did you make that motion? Thank you. <laughs> uh, all in favor, please say aye or yes. Aye. 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 Thanks very much. Any opposed? No. Great. All right. Next is the uh, 
floor finishes and the finish remover specifications. And that's the same. We had no comments and we did not change it from last time. So All right. We can so run through this. The spec is the same as was tentatively approved. Does anyone have any questions, comments? No? Anyone uh, want to make a motion to approve the floor finishes and finish removers specification for final approval? Oh, thank you, Beth. Uh, and uh, all in favor, please say aye or yes. Aye. Any opposed? Great. That is approved. Next is the uh, monochrome toner cartridges. This was uh, tentatively approved last year. Uh, Beth, I don't think we had any Didn't comments. Any comments, no comments, no. And I am excited that this is happening before the green, um, the not the green, but the procurement forum uh, in two weeks because, or next week actually, because um, folks that offer these on contract from preferred sources and, and on state contract have been asking for this, for, for this to be done for a long time and it's really, an encouragement to use remanufactured toner cartridges, but with certain kinds of performance requirements. So I'm very excited about this spec. Great. Uh, it's the same spec as was tentatively approved. So are there any questions or comments? No? Okay. Uh, I'll take a motion to approve for final approval the monochrome toner cartridges specification. A motion. Heather, all in favor, please say aye or yes. Aye. aye. <coughs> Any opposition? Nope. Fantastic. That is approved. Uh, next is the state funded food specification, uh, which Brendan talked about last year. It's tentatively approved. I don't think there was any public comment, but uh, if anyone has any questions, Brendan. Okay, then I'll take a motion to approve, for final approval, the state-funded food specification. I so move. I like food. <laughs> Jody, I appreciate that. Uh, all in favor, please say aye or yes. Aye. aye. Any opposed? <coughs> That's approved. And the last tentatively approved specification uh, is the state-funded lodging specification. Uh, Brendan Woodruff from DEC also worked on this. Uh, there were no public, there were no comments received during the public comment period. Um, but if there are any questions, Brendan would be happy to answer them. Any questions? Nope. All right. Then I'll take a motion to approve for final approval the state funded lodging specification. I will move. Thank you, Beth. All in favor, please say aye or yes. Aye. aye. Any opposed? Nope. Great. That is approved. Thank you all very much. We had a lot of tentative specs from last year. Um, okay, so we're going to pick up some time. We're going to move on to the uh, new specifications that we're going to vote on for tentative approval. I just wanted to quickly remind um, the committee that last year there was a discussion of changing the process by which specifications can go from tentative approval to final approval um, because, and I'll remind everybody um, of the highlights, when this interagency committee started in 2008 and 2009, um, the committee met uh, several times a year uh, and it since has become more of an annual meeting during Earth Week. So um, a lot of these tentative specs that don't really have any public, nobody comments on them, there's no negative feedback. Uh, we felt like we shouldn't have to wait a year for them to actually take effect and be considered final, finally approved. So uh, we had distributed a new process that, uh, are you raising your hand, Bill, or you just? No, 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 I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> you got me excited there. Yeah, well, that's all right. That's, it is exciting. Um, so Beth uh, and I worked on this process by which 
if a um, specification is, is tentatively approved by this committee, it would be posted for public approval uh, like usual. And in addition, it would also be published in two out of the three, uh, either the New York Register, the New York Contract Reporter, uh, and or the Environmental Notice Bulletin. So my understanding from ESD is that the Contract Reporter doesn't really have a miscellaneous section and it's uh, not really an appropriate place to publish these. However, it is widely read, so if they will take him, uh, we will try to put it in the contract reporter. But if not, uh, the New York Register has a miscellaneous section and uh, they welcome our, our publishing them there. Uh, in addition, DEC uh, maintains the environmental notice bulletin, so we'll publish these uh, tentatively approved specifications there. Um, and we will also post them on the OGS website, on the Green NY website for public comment. And uh, if there are no negative comments or no comments at all received after 90 days, they will be considered finally approved. Also, uh, on a kind of a case-by-case uh, -case basis, we'll consider distributing them even more widely to the uh, appropriate industry. You heard from John earlier on the furniture spec, how much uh, he went back and forth with um, people in the furniture industry. So they will be uh, distributed broadly. And um, if they are at all controversial, then, and there are comments received, then the process will remain the same. We'll wait till this body votes on them again, probably a year later for final approval and any changes will be shown to everybody uh, at this meeting. But if not, after 90 days, they'll be considered approved. And we did uh, distribute this. Um, Matt, I think from DOT, had asked to go back to the contract reporter and uh, ask one more time if they can be published there. So I did that and um, it still doesn't seem that they will be, but we'll, we can keep trying. Um, and I did receive six affirmative votes from agencies uh, on this committee. So this process is approved and with these tentative specifications um, or with these two new specifications, if they're tentatively approved today, we'll start the new process. Are there any questions on that? So we have two new specifications. The first is the uh, battery specification that Brendan Woodruff from DEC worked on. So Brendan will lead us through that spec. Sure, thank you very much, Darren. Um, so first off, I'd like to uh, say a couple thank yous for people who were instrumental in putting this specification together. Uh, John Vanna at DEC was very helpful with that. Heather Saunders at NYSERDA helped with their battery expertise. Todd Gardner helped us out quite a bit with getting uh, purchasing data. Uh, Diana at DOH was really helpful and gave us a lot of good data of what they use. DOT provided some information and there were a lot of DEC operations staff that were helpful as well. So this specification is for single use AA, AAA, and D batteries. Um, and what we did first was we kind of looked at how, what is the state purchasing? What are we using? Is it worth it to go through the process of creating a specification for this? And we found that um, a conservative estimate is that the state is purchasing about $550,000 worth of single-use batteries every year. And if these all went to landfill, it would add 61,000 pounds of waste to our waste stream every year. So when we look at our EO4 reporting every year, uh, this is an area where we can significantly cut down on that. Um, and in addition to taking up space in landfills, uh, batteries also include heavy metals such as mercury, lead, cadmium, and nickel, which if batteries are not properly disposed of can have negative environmental impacts. Um, so we also took a look at what other states were doing. We found a study by the uh, Missouri State Recycling Program, and they found that a single rechargeable battery used 300 times could save an upwards of $450 per battery. So there's huge savings to be had as well. Um, so overall, we think this spec is a win-win-win. Uh, it's going to allow us to cut operating costs for the state. It's going to reduce the waste streams that we produce. And it's going to advance the rechargeable battery market by increasing the amount that we're purchasing. 
So a little bit of background on the, how we created the spec. Uh, this was based off of uh, research that was conducted by the Responsible Purchasing Network in the city of San Francisco. <coughs> they were looking for a way to get more rechargeable batteries into their agency's hands and get them using them for the uh, reasons that I've outlined here before. And they did a real comprehensive study looking at what was available on the market today. They tested batteries for quality, uh, for the amount of power that they have, and all sorts of different attributes. Uh, because in the past, agencies, and probably some of us as well in our personal lives, have used rechargeable batteries and some of the first generation ones, and they didn't work all that great. There were some that didn't have as much power as the alkalines, others would lose their charge. So they really wanted to make sure that if they're going to have agencies using these batteries, that they're quality batteries, they work well, and that they're going to allow the agencies to carry out their missions. So we used this study for the basis of evaluating whether or not we could take the work that they had done and apply it to New York's context, and that's where we did all of the research on our purchasing, uh, where the batteries were going, how they were being used, uh, and different things such as that. Um, so we have three main sources of batteries. We have uh, two of the preferred sources in the Granger contract is where most of the batteries are purchased from right now. And as I mentioned before, it's about $550,000 worth of purchases. So uh, we went through, and it was a very collaborative process. Uh, we created a working group, and we got input from DEC's e-waste and product stewardship uh, group. We got information from DEC's operations staff. Uh, DOH provided us quite a bit of good battery um, information on their battery use. We had information from NYSERDA uh, and quite a few others as well. And that really allowed us to put together a spec that not only just says, here's what a quality battery is, but it allows us to put together something that's going to be very useful for the agencies now that we know what the use context is of what they're using these batteries for. So the specification itself, it's designed to be a simple guide to follow. Um, we also are creating guidance that's being put together right now that's going to be put together and released to the sustainability coordinators and operations staff in conjunction with this. So they'll be getting the specification itself and a guidance document to help them implement the spec. And it's in hierarchy form. So the spec itself, the first section, is we're re uh, recommending that agencies minimize the need to purchase single-use batteries in the first place, so source reduction, if you will. We're saying if there's two electronics out there um, and there's a, there's a piece of equipment that can be hardwired into a wall or it has a lithium-ion rechargeable battery, purchase that first over a piece of equipment that re uh, requires the use of single-use batteries. That way you're just eliminating the need to get these um, entirely. And um, so the second part is if you need to purchase single-use batteries, we're requiring that you purchase rechargeable ones. Now this does have an exception. I know we're talking about a requirement here. And the exception for agencies is in certain medical or emergency use devices. Um, and we leave that broad. We don't define what emergency or medical use is. We allow the agencies and the authorities to come up with that definition on their own. So if they don't feel comfortable using rechargeable batteries in a device for any number of reasons, they then have the ability to say, we're just going to use single-use alkalines. Um, but if you're using something like a, um, an optical mouse or office equipment or something, that's where we're saying you should be using rechargeable batteries so that we can get the benefits uh, that you get with those. So. With that, um, we also include specifications that were developed by RPN's testing uh, to ensure that they get quality batteries when they do purchase them. And there's three attributes that we require. Uh, the first is that it uses a nickel metal hydrate chemistry. They found that this works the best. Um, lithium ion, I know, is all the rage out there, and that's what you're using in your cell phones and in um, you know laptops and things like that. But they found that in the smaller um, portions that you have for the the single-use batteries, it doesn't work as well as the, the traditional nickel metal hydride. Uh, we also required that it uses self low self-discharge technology, and this ensures that the batteries keep their charge when they're in storage. That was a problem with a lot of the first generation uh, rechargeable batteries, so this way if you charge it, you put it in a drawer for six <laughs> months, you pull it out to use it, it's still going to be good to go. It's not going to lose much of its charge. And the third is that there's a minimum power rating that we included to make sure that they last as long as single-use alkalines. So that way, uh, when somebody gets the battery, you know, they're used to what, how long, let's say it's a clock, they're used to how long a single-use alkaline lasts. It's going to last the same amount of time, so it's not going to change their operations staff's uh, schedule for looking at when batteries are going. The third thing we include is uh, recommendations on what type of charger to purchase. 
uh, we recommend that they purchase a charger that can charge any uh, different type or size of rechargeable battery. That way you only need to purchase one per facility, so that way it cuts down on costs. Uh, and also we recommend that they purchase a charger that charges one battery at a time. And the reason for this is that if they need, let's say they have a big bank of charging batteries, they need to grab a couple quick. The first couple are going to be fully charged and the others won't have started yet. You can take the first ones out, they're fully charged, they're ready to use, ready to go, as opposed to having each one at a partial charge. Um, so that is for certain use cases where you need to cycle the batteries out pretty quickly. Uh, the fourth section that we include is proper disposal to make sure that they're handled correctly at the end of life. For single-use alkaline batteries where agencies are still using them in certain instances, we recommend that they be recycled. There are some recycling programs out there that are available, so we recommend that agencies and authorities look at those and see if they work for them. Uh, and for the nickel metal hydrate rechargeables that we're requiring uh, the agencies to use, those have to be recycled in New York. It is illegal to knowingly throw them in the trash due to some of the chemicals that are in them. But the good thing with this and with the recharging uh, or with the recycling programs with this is that there are lots of free industry funded programs. I uh, DEC in our central office, we have a box that we were sent by one of these programs. We just fill it up with rechargeable batteries. Once it's filled, we then go ahead mail it back in, we get another box, and that's at no cost to us. So if uh, an agency is using rechargeable batteries at a facility, they can get a free box, fill it up, send it in. They can re uh, recycle these very easily. Uh, the fifth section that we have is just some best practices uh, to make sure that they get the best use that they can out of the batteries. We recommend that they store them at room temperature to keep the charge. And we also recommend that they charge them before their first use, even if the package says pre-charged. This way, they're guaranteed to be at 100% when they first install them. And then the last part we have is our generic packing, packaging language, which goes on all of our specifications. So in conclusion here, um, this is a specification that really has the ability to be a true triple win for us. Again, it, we're going to save significant amounts of money, up to $450 and hopefully more per battery itself. Uh, we're also going to decrease our waste quite a bit. The batteries are heavy. It's about 20 single-use batteries to a pound. So you can see how many of these we are disposing of now. Uh, and we'll see those numbers in our EO4 reporting. That's one of the really good things about having a report every year is we'll be able to actually see this pan out as agencies have less waste. Uh, in addition, it's going to advance the rechargeable battery market. We talk about kind of creating a virtuous circle where we use our purchasing power to be able to lower the price of these uh, products for everybody by bu us buying in bulk. So hopefully uh, when we, when other industries and when the general public sees our leadership on this issue, they're going to go out and be able to purchase rechargeable batteries for a lower price and we're going to expand the market. So thank you. Are there any questions? Question. Yeah. Um, when you calculated the savings, did you mm -hmm. take into consideration the cost of the chargers as well? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, that was in their calculations. Okay. Brendan, can other agencies get that box you were talking about where you could put in, I know it would probably be nice at OGS if the buildings operations guys had the battery recycling that would be easy. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, they can do that. do that. Yeah, and there's a number of programs that are out there. As I said, they're industry funded by regulation now. Um, and essentially just call up one of these companies, say I'd like a box. And the thing, that it, the thing about it now is it's only for rechargeables. Um, and one of the things that we found is we have to go through and sort batteries occasionally because people will throw alkalines in there. Um, but yeah, they're very simple to get, and I can get that information to you. Okay, that'd be great. Mm -hmm. And there, maybe I missed this, I apologize, but there's, is there guidance on how to recycle uh, alkaline batteries? Yeah, that's information that we have in our guidance document. So when that comes out, that'll be, and one of the good things about that is that a lot of the companies that do the rechargeables recycling also do the alkaline. So it's pretty much kind of a, you can do a one-stop shop type of thing. So the guidance is what? It's a training piece gotcha. that we'll post on the web and send awesome. out to coordinators um, um, once this is past its 90-day period or okay. just about when it's ready to oh, <laughs> be it, past that's it. Yeah. That's yeah. great. All right. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thanks a lot. <coughs> great job. Nice job, Brendan. Yes. Thank you. So uh, all right. Any other questions for Brendan? OK, so I will a motion to uh, tentatively, well, I'll take a motion to tentatively approve the specification on 
triple A, double A, and D batteries. I'll make the motion. Thank you, Heather. So all in favor of tentative approval for this specification, please say aye or yes. Aye. aye. Thank you. Any opposed? So the battery specification is tentatively approved. It will be posted for public comment on the Green and Y website mm -hmm. and published in the register, the contract reporter, and or the environmental notice board. So lastly, we have an amended uh, specification that was called the single use food containers specification. Um, Beth is going to walk us through this, and it's going to be called the Food Services Containers and Packaging Spec. Right, and I also want to thank some people for this. Um, one of the people that's worked a lot on this with me this year is Todd Gardner. Um, and uh, Evan Barr has helped a lot with the last minute editing of all this. When you have a lot of different track changes and you're trying to make them clean, it's not easy. <laughs> so. Um, this was also a change to uh, an original specification, so the track changes is what we're considering now. Um, it, there is a lot of new language here. This was triggered by, in the past year, we became aware um, that food containers and wrappers contain perfluorinated chemicals. These are usually short chain uh, perfluorinated chemicals, but there are a class of chemicals that are related to the perfluorinated chemicals that were found contaminating drinking water in Hoosick Falls and Newburgh, something that my commissioner and the governor are, is very concerned about, um, PFOA and PFOS, which have been um, found to have uh, potential for human health impacts and environmental impacts. And there's a growing body of concern about this lower, shorter chain um, smaller, shorter chain uh, perfluorinated chemicals that are still being used in commerce. And one of the products that they're found in is a compostable product that we require under this specification, and we label them green. So we wanted to address that problem with this specification. So we amended the existing specification to prohibit perfluorinated chemicals in food containers and we expanded the definition of covered products to include packaging because wrappers, paper wrappers and things like that can also have these perfluorinated chemicals in them. They are added intentionally in order to be, be a grease barrier for food. We also um, expanded the focus of the specification from simply single use food service, um, food containers to food containers in general and made a, or created a hierarchy similar to what Brendan was talking about for batteries where we focus first on reuse and we say that using reusable food containers where you can in the cafeteria or elsewhere is the best and highest um, choice and then we go down from there to compostable containers that do not contain perfluorinated chemicals, recyclable containers, um, recycled content containers and containers that have sustainably harvest content. So we created this hierarchy there. While doing that work, we determined that we wanted a restriction on polystyrene or styrofoam. Styrofoam is just blown out poly, um, polystyrene. It's the same exact chemical. It's just the way it's manufactured. They blow air into it. Styrene itself is a human carcinogen. We have limited um, products containing uh, styrene chemicals in carpet, for example, because styrene is a human carcinogen. The effect is not in the product itself, it's in manufacturing. Um, and styrofoam is slow to degrade in the environment, it's very abundant in litter, and it is not recycled in New York State. Um, so we would decided to restrict that in the recycled, uh, recyclable um, content section of our hierarchy. And then we updated and expanded the standards and certifications that apply to compostable containers to include um, the Cedar Grove list that's from Cedar Grove, I believe it's Oregon, it's Oregon or Washington, I don't know my head right now, but anyway, we expanded that because that's an important list also of things that are compostable. Um, and that's a kind of high level view, but I'm happy to go into more detail, and I'm hoping that Darren will be happy with me that I'm making a shorter. <laughs> 
No, I know it's a, it's a complex issue and best work very hard on this along with uh, Todd oh, and DOH. I forgot, to DOH. And I forgot to thank DOH. Thank you, Diana, for your team. Diana was very instrumental in getting her team together on this one as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, some chemists on this one. So uh, are there any other questions or comments? All right, then I will take a motion to tentatively approve the amended uh, food container specification. I will make that motion. Thank you, Jody. I hate stuff. Oh, yeah. All in favor of tentative approval for the uh, food service containers and packaging specification, please say aye or yes. Aye. Aye. Thank you. Any opposed? All right. So that spec is tentatively approved. It'll be posted on Green NY and uh, published uh, in the reporter and the ENB. And uh, we've reached the end of the agenda. So if there are no other comments, then uh, thank you, everybody. We are thank adjourned you. for 20 seconds. <laughs> nice job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.